We're joined today by uh, Corey Cook, who is the uh, now <laughs> acting administrator for, for this region, for GSA, and in a new role, as well as Melissa Braxton, uh, formerly with 18F, and, and now also going on to, to new things as well. As we get started here, uh, if you could just introduce yourselves, give the, give the room a little bit of your uh, background on who you are, where you come from, and, and what you're doing now. Corey? Hi, thank you all for being here. I'm Corey Cook. I'm currently serving as the Acting Regional Administrator for the General Services Administration um, in the Northwest Arctic region, which covers Alaska, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. Um, I originally, in the past year, I just started on Monday, so um, here I have been um, at what we call 18F, which is our central office headquarters in Washington, D.C. for the past year, serving as the administrator's senior advisor for cyber and technology. Um, and prior to that, I spent many years um, on Capitol Hill, so I am pretty familiar with government. And technically, I'm an attorney by trade, but I've never been like a real attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Melissa. Great, so um, thanks again for having me here. Um, so as you mentioned, I, I was uh, formerly working at 18F as a user experience researcher and designer. Um, and for those of you who don't know 18F, uh, it's a, a federal government agency that's like a consultancy for other federal government agencies to help them design their technology and their digital services, which it could be any number of things. It could be a process, it could be a, you know, a website, but really anything that helps them improve the uh, public's interaction with the services that the government provides and also you know, improves the, the working lives of um, uh, public employees. Uh, so I uh, was at 18F for, for a few years. Prior to that, um, I'm actually a local Seattleite. I was working remotely uh, with 18F. Prior to that, I was um, working at the University of Washington doing design research and also uh, working on a PhD in human-centered design and engineering, which I, I put on hold to take the job at 18F. Uh, as you said, I'm, I'm moving on to other things. I actually just recently joined a, a local Seattle-based uh, UX research and design consulting firm called Blink UX, and I'll be starting there tomorrow. Fantastic, thanks. Also, I wanted to open it up to, to the audience. I've got plenty of questions. Uh, we, we've done a few prep calls. I can talk with these two all day. Uh, but if any of you out there have questions, don't hesitate, raise your hands. Uh, uh, if, I, if I don't see you, get up, jump around a little bit, make sure I, you catch my eye, and we'll, we'll make sure we get all your questions answered. As we, as we get going here, jump right in. Corey, agencies are under a mandate to modernize their IT system. But a lot of them were interested in, in doing so before. Now, with this mandate, they're moving forward. Some people have a full understanding of what they're trying to do. Other people are trying to figure out exactly what, where, why, and the like. From your experience, what are the benefits of modernization? Obviously, you think of cost, you think of speed, but can you give us an idea of the full range of why it's important to modernize your IT systems? So I think the president's uh, FY, fiscal year um, 19 budget, talks about it a lot and about the benefits of modernizing technology not just for, as you said, you know, there's obviously a lot of cost savings there because right now legacy systems maintenance operating costs are phenomenal. Um, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, um, in January put out some new numbers saying we spend about $90 billion on IT in the federal government. So there's a lot of opportunity for cost savings and for just standard efficiencies as we modernize. But the real benefit is actually to the taxpayers um, and Melissa's work, I think, has done a lot of this, where if you right now are having to process a form on an old system, it, that's not efficient for you. Like, everybody, not everybody, a lot of people have smartphones, iPads, that type of technology. You want the American taxpayer to be able to engage with the systems in the same way. And that, I think, is really the benefit. Excellent. And Melissa, the modernization, right, you can get cost savings, you can get all these other things, but there's other opportunities in UX, as, as Corey mentioned. Can mm -hmm. you talk about how you frame that discussion when you talk with agency partners about using this as an opportunity? Yeah, I, want, I just wanted to say that, you know, there are, um, you know, an, an effort to modernize or move to a new system or change the, um, you know, move away from maybe an older legacy system really is, can be, um, an amazing opportunity to sort of refocus around the, you know, the primary value that your your service, your agency, or your, maybe it's an, a, a specific application, um, should, is, is aiming to create and then, you know, using the opportunity to then sort of refocus around, you know, the value that you're attempting to create, and then, you know, what will it take to actually 
create that value for the people who use the service, for the people who use the system, whether that's members of the public or whether it's you know um, employees or, or, or staff at your organization. Um, but you know, using that modernization effort to sort of refocus around what are the needs of the people who use the system, who's going to be impacted by any change to this system, and then how can we approach changing it uh, by putting their needs at the center um, and beginning there. So to wrap up this whole thought in a slightly different way, what is the goal of modernization? I think that the goal of modernization is very, it's a broad, broad way to look at it. Um, but the goal really is to benefit the American people, whether that is from, you know, Melissa's former vantage point, my current vantage point as a government employee, making it so that we can more effectively do our jobs to serve the American people, or whether it's so that anyone who comes into contact, because we come into contact with government services all the time, um, and making sure that you have the best experience there is. Excellent. So with that in mind, as you, if you're an agency and you're about to start a large modernization project, and that's your goal, right? Your goal is to improve the citizen experience through all of this. Where do you start your planning process with that in mind? Do you start with let's go rip, you know, rip and replace a bunch of old servers, or do you have to start somewhere else? Um, yeah, so bringing it back to what I was saying earlier, I think you know, really the important place to start is sort of somewhat agnostic maybe to um, modernizing our technology or you know, moving away from a legacy system, you know, beginning with what is the key problem that our service or our, our system um, needs to solve? Who are we solving this problem for? And what do those people need? So really, you know, and again, as my perspective is really um, from a UX research and design perspective, you know, starting with getting that fundamental understanding of who is going to be affected by any change to the system, what their needs are, and then, you know, beginning to prioritize uh, key features or functionality um, then and based on, you know, putting highest priority needs first and then sort of working in that direction in a modular way. How hard is it to figure out who your customer is? It depends, you know. Um, <laughs> you know it depends. You know, there are some, some services where it's very clear and some where it's a little less, less clear. Um. So, Corey, as someone who was advising on, on IT and security and, and these things for, for GSA, uh, what are some of the barriers that you saw that, that people had to overcome? So I think everyone has some, it, it depends what you're going at uniquely. I think uh, in December uh, 2017, um, the American Technology Council, along with GSA, DHS, Commerce, and OMB, released an uh, IT report to the president that gives a bunch of steps outlining sort of, there's about 50 action items for how to get us to the next phase. And in there, one of the comprehensive things that's looked at is key barriers, which we've already talked about, mainly that being if you have a legacy system, if it's a high value asset system, you need to move that forward to make your infrastructure, your enterprise very secure. And then, as we've also discussed, that should help with the cost and improve the citizen function. So it keeps being that's what they're trying to get at, but the actual barriers of getting there really depend on your agency. And so it would be premature for me to sort of say what every agency has, because everybody is different. Fair, fair. Uh, Melissa, what are some of the things you've seen specifically? What, understanding that everybody's different, have you seen anything repeat uh, or anything that, that can be generalized somewhat? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, just to, to plus one to what Corey is saying and that, you know, it really does depend. Um, and, you know, s certainly the ultimate goal is always going to be, you know, improving the public's experience interacting with government services and, and experience for public employees. Um, but, you know, sort of one next level beneath that, it sort of depends on what specific challenge you're facing. It could be, you know, data that you need to manage, the volume of data is increasing and, you know, your infrastructure isn't, isn't going to be able to handle that, that increasing volume of data going forward. Or it could be something like, um, you know, the legacy system is, is no longer going to be supported by the vendor. And so, you know, there's, there's an imperative to, to, to figure out what's next. Um, but, um, 
in terms of some of the challenges, you know, part of it is, you know, finding a place to start because for some of these legacy systems are so intertwined with everything that the that that's just it's it's the back can be the backbone of a service and, and really overwhelming to just to just figure out you know how you know where do we even start. So again, you know, going through um, some work and some research to understand, you know, here's the key problem we need to solve, um, here's who we need to solve it for, and then what do those people need? And really going out and trying to do some research, talk to them, um, you know, talking to the actual users of the system. And I, I think and one thing that, um, you know, you mentioned that sometimes it can be hard to even know who your users are, that, that's very true. And there are reasons, there, there are real reasons why, um, you know, that might be unclear. <laughs> um, so you know, it's 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 not unreasonable to to have that be the first challenge. But you know, finding out who those folks are, you know, is a first step, and then going out and talking to them and understanding what their needs are. One thing that I do uh, that I have seen though is, um, you know. Uh, there are lots and lots of agencies out there who are going out and regularly engaging with their users, and um, I think the the language and the um, so yeah, the language of human-centered design um, and user-centered design, you know, it makes a lot of wonderful intuitive sense. Absolutely, everyone wants to do what's best for their users. Everyone wants to go and, and engage them and, and talk to them. But one thing that I've seen is that, um, you know, within human-centered design, there are specific sort of approaches to engaging with users that will help you make sense of what you learn from them and help you um, act on it. Uh, but um, so I, I, I have seen, you know, cases where there are folks who are, you know, going out and talking to users and then coming back and feeling overwhelmed saying, you know, we have a very diverse user community. How in the world can we give every single individual user everything that they have asked for? Um, so um, one thing I've seen is, you know, um, you know, just helping to skill up, you know, um, in, in just different approaches to engaging with users, how and when to um, reach out to them and how and when to incorporate uh, what you learn into your ongoing design and development process. Excellent. And Corey, for agency leaders, program leaders who aren't technologists, can you give them some advice, you know, similar to, to what Melissa was saying, is there any advice that you can give on how to overcome challenges, understanding that they're going to be diverse? Are there any silver bullets there? So I will say a couple of things. One, it always helps when your senior leadership is engaged in modernizing your technology. Um, decisions, as most people know, tend to be made from the top down, and so it's really helpful when your senior leadership is engaged. From GSA's perspective, um, I would argue that GSA, so General Services Administration, back in the day, was started to sort of say, oh, what is the standard stuff every agency needs and how can we help them and make it most efficient? Well, nowadays, everyone needs technology, so GSA has taken that on, and we have things like Melissa's former team, 18F, which can come in and help you. We have the new centers of excellence, which are meant to sort of say, hey, this is a key area. The first customer for the centers of excellence is USDA, and their senior leadership there is really invested in it, and so I think that's gonna make a really transformative change. So um, I would say from a GSA perspective, we have a lot of resources that can help our customer agencies advance, and we love to work with them. And if the senior leadership is engaged, that's usually the best way because people can have a lot of great ideas, but it's great to know that when you go to your CIO, your CIO is going to say, yes, I want to move that way instead of saying, absolutely not. <laughs> and you actually are in kind of a unique position to talk about this right now because you're going from someone who was pushing senior leaders as an advisor to, to try to modernize to someone who's going to be a leader and is going to get probably some push from, from people down below. So what, what advice do you have if, you're, if your leadership is a little on the fence about a program that you think is important, how do you get them on board? And similarly, as, a, as someone who's becoming a leader, how do you want to be pitched to? That is a, that is a unique question. I think everyone's, everyone's different. Um, for me, personally, I, I like numbers. I like data analysis, and that is one of the the great things about technology is that we're being able to get more transparent and get that data. And so if you're able to say, um, for example, I know at GSA we have someone who's working on robotic process automation. Um, and that actually started out of our New York region. And they 
have found that through using this tool, they believe they're going to take something that uh, has, it was a very low cost to pilot it out, and they believe right now through their prototypes and testing, they're going to be able to save, you know, lots of time where folks were gathering, you know, data, for example, and revive that so maybe the process tool takes, it's something phenomenal like 15 seconds, but would take 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I don't remember the exact number, but it's a lot of value. And if you can show senior leaders that number and say, hey, you know what, my contracting officer, <laughs> instead of entering in this data or pulling whatever that is, we can use this other system. It's low cost, high value. I, I think that tends to be pretty easy math. And if someone came to me with that, I'd go, okay, that makes sense. But <laughs> and that's what I would also do for my senior leaders. Excellent, excellent. Keeping with you for, for a moment, because you mentioned you know, uh, that, the, that robotics was piloted in, in New York, basically not DC. Mm -hmm. How important is it that people outside, you know, uh, maybe this is a conceit that, that I hold because I, I'm stuck in the beltway. How much innovative stuff is coming from outside DC and how important is it that leaders reach out and, and find those, those interesting nuggets? So the fun fact is that the majority of federal workers are not in DC. We're not that important? Yeah, it, the fun, that's fun fact. Um, and so in looking at that, I think it, it is really important, and especially um, from a piloting standpoint, if we're talking about pilots, if we're talking about agile, if you go to one region and say, well, uh, region 10, that's my region, we have this way of doing it. If region nine, which is the California area, if they decide they're gonna pilot a different way, that's some pretty, you know, direct comparisons that you can do if you're piloting things. So I think it is very helpful having that ability for outside the Beltway to test different things. You also have different customers outside the, the Beltway. Um, out here, I, I now have Alaska. Alaska is very different from New York City. It's just the facts. <laughs> they might need different technologies, different things. Excellent. So for both of you, I mean, we'll start with, with Melissa on this one. What are some of those interesting things that you've seen agencies working on? You know, 18F, you're not just in GSA, you get uh, uh, brought to other agencies. What are, what are some cool technologies, some cool efforts you've seen going on? Uh, well, I mean, I would encourage everyone to go check out 18F's blog and look at all of the great things that uh, teams are working on there. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, you know, 18F, um, you know, provides a, a whole range of different kinds of of things that we can we can work with. Or we, <laughs> I say, I say we, although I'm no longer there anymore. That they, they under GSA, um, you know, can support you with us. So Corey sort of alluded to, you know, there are um, small teams that come in and do, you know, just just discovery research to help you find that starting place. Um, and then there are small teams that come in and can actually, you know, be working on helping you build. Uh, what it is you might need. Um, also, one of the really, one of the many really awesome things that I think that um, AT&F and, and GSA can do uh, is that there's a whole group that has expertise in acquisitions and actually partners with with your agency to um, provide oversight and quality assurance for work that vendors are producing, um, and then um, you know guidance and support and some of these best practices in human-centered design and agile software development that that sort of thing. Very cool. Can, can you add a little bit about some of the projects you've worked on? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the projects that, um, you know, you, you can certainly go and, go and read about, um, you know, was some work that um, I did with the FEC just looking at how to um, sort of modernize their electronic filing uh, system and and help better better manage the data that that comes in and um, you know getting to better 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 data quality by providing a better um, you know user experience for the campaign finance professionals that are actually responsible for submitting that information. Uh, so and, and I like I love those kind of projects that definitely have a, a broader Ameri you know impact on the American citizen right FEC is a very important tool for for transparency but also making the federal employees lives easier who are actually doing the work and that, yeah. that's a great synergy there absolutely so uh, uh, Corey what are some of the interesting projects that, that you've seen so I think I alluded to one of them um, so there's the robotic process automation tool which I mentioned comes out of region 2 there's also so we have the Federal Acquisition Service, which is what 18F is part of now. Um, and they have another distributed ledger technology where they're working with blockchain to work on doing the contract process. And that, again, new, emerging, they're piloting it, but 
all of these things are showing great promise. Um, we have our Office of Government-Wide Policy, who also recently did a uh, solution, SRT, but sometimes I use acronyms so much I don't remember what they stand for, so it's like solicitation review tool, but if I, I apologize, OGP, if I'm getting the name wrong. Point being that we've done a bunch of interesting things working with emerging tech, and then broadly, we have our new five centers of excellence, which right now are really focused on USDA, but they are going in and doing some great work to figure out how to modernize that agency or department. And it's, it's a huge department, so it's definitely a large undertaking. So for, for other agencies who see the, the centers of excellence being stood up and USDA getting, getting all this help, and they go, we, we want help too, how can they get involved in this? I would say that they should reach out to the Centers of Excellence team. Um, right now, that's being led by Joanne Collins Smee. She's also um, our new head of TTS. So, but if you reach out to them, they will be as responsive as possible. And we have, um, if, if anyone wants information, let us know. We will get you in touch with the right folks. Excellent. Melissa, we talked before about you know how your UX focus doesn't isn't just important for the citizen, but also for federal employees. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how modernization overall is going to affect the workforce? Well, I, you know, I think it depends on you know what where you are and what your what your work is. Um, but you know, I think fundamentally, you know, a goal is to free federal employees from doing unnecessary overhead tasks, you know, things like double data entry that, you know, is something that you often see, um, you know, unnecessary overhead tasks to really focus on, you know, better serving citizens. Excellent. Yeah, and we had the uh, o OPM came out with that uh, workforce priorities report recently. It said that, uh, I might have this flip, but 60% of the federal workforce could see their daily routine tasks uh, lowered by 30% using automation tools and that sort of thing. Corey, to get there, does the workforce itself have to change? So I'm gonna go with that's outside my purview. That's OPM, that's OMB. It is one of the president's management agenda items, but those are being led by OPM and OMB, and so I would defer all of that to those folks. Okay. Let me try, see if I can frame it in a different way that would that would hit your skills, and feel free to, <laughs> to do it again. But what kind of skills are needed to modernize? Is there a certain way people think? Is there a certain training or a certain background? You know, you mentioned you're a lawyer by trade, but you work in technology. Is there a way, is there something that you look for in people to lead these modernization efforts? I think, so maybe this is too broad, but I think anyone can learn technology, can be a part of technology. It just takes having that interest and desire. And there's a way to apply your skills in all different ways. So I am, as you mentioned, I'm an attorney by trade, but back when I was in school, I worked at an Apple store. So I think it just depends on what your interest is and anyone who wants to learn, I think can. I don't, I think that's one of the great benefits about technology too, is it's supposed to make learning and working easier. How about you, Melissa, in, in your space and from your experience, for those feds out there who maybe don't have a technology background but want to be part of this effort because they, they have that passion, what have you seen, what kind of skills and thought processes, mentalities have you seen that apply well to these efforts? Mm. Um, you know, well, I agree with Corey that, you know, m people from, you know, many, many different educational backgrounds and, and work experience backgrounds, um, you know, are part of the effort. I really do think it takes a whole team effort um, you know, at every levels of an organization, really, to to see the kind of change that that you know I think we're hoping to see. Um, but I would certainly say, you know, openness to doing things differently, uh, because you know it really is ultimately going to be about doing things differently and doing th moving forward and doing things differently in, in different ways than you may have always done. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I try and do it just as a on the ground as a user, user experience researcher and designer is to actually bring uh, people from various levels of the organization in to sit in on interviews and observations with end users, you know, so that the knowledge of who the users are and what they need just really diffuses throughout the organization so that hopefully, you know, everybody in the organization ends up having that knowledge and understanding. Excellent. Do we have any questions uh, from, the, from the audience here before I keep going? We have a uh, roving mic. Yeah, one right over here. Yeah. 
from the GSA standpoint, uh, either Corey or Melissa, how do you engage the private sector? What is the role of the private sector, number one? Number two is how do you engage the private sector in your modernization uh, process? So the private sector is vitally important, and that's actually one of the benefits about some of the things I was talking about getting our contracting officers to be able to use all of these other emerging technologies means that they can spend more time actually doing industry outreach, learning about commercial best practices. Um, a lot of folks may be aware, but in the efforts like the IT modernization report, we put that report out for public comment so that industry could say, hey government, this is where you're going right and this is where you are not going right. Um, so the industry is a vital partner. If you don't learn from how commercial best practices are doing, you're not right. And from a GSA perspective, we have reverse industry days. We have industry events all the time. Um, hearing from our vendors and our contractors is important. So next question following that is the new, uh, is the acting administrator now for this area. How do you plan to engage, because uh, we, we have a lot of tech areas, you know, a lot of tech uh, uh, expertise here in this area from small business all the way to large business including you know Microsoft Amazon and others all the way down to mom and pop shops and so on like this how do you how do you plan to engage them I mean through the GSA catalog or, or how, how, how do we get involved so I don't this was part I probably didn't say it. I spent a lot of time on the hill on the committee on small business and I worked on government um, contracting issues to help small businesses so I am very familiar with all of the government contracting and the requirements for small businesses. And that's something I'm personally passionate about because I think a lot of the emerging technology starts in a small shop. So in my role, I'm hoping to work with our Ozdebu in our office and get out and hear from small businesses and hear what we need to know and just listen. So I am pretty open to meeting with folks and I know that our administrator, Emily, is also very willing to hear from small businesses and other folks in the industry. So I hope to get out and meet people. I hope if we have events that folks do come in and let me know what their obstacles are, what they think. And and uh, I like the Ozdebu. I think we should use that like Sibboleth. Like if you, if you don't know what Ozdebu means, you can't come in the room for these. these Office kind of, of Small yeah. and Disadvantaged <laughs> Business yeah. Utilization. Uh, I, I love that. Was just the way that flowed off your tongue, though, was, was perfect. <laughs> uh, Melissa, as, as someone who is a co internal consultant for the government, who's kind of you know, taking that private sector mentality into government, how do you work with the private sector? How do you bring, even if you're not just paying a contractor, how can you bring the private sector in and, and really engage with them? Well, I do want to clarify that I'm, I'm no longer a GSA employee, <laughs> so former, formerly. Um, how would you like to be engaged now that you're in the private sector? <laughs> well, um, um, so you're saying how you know how had I engaged with private private sector companies and whatnot? Okay. Well, I think that the you know the the primary example of me really engaging with with the private sector through through work that I did at GSA was really through um, the Office of Acquisitions, where we did you know um, partner with an agency or uh, to um, help them you know find the right vendor to you know build the thing that. Um, you know, we'd, we'd sort of worked on to, to research and identify the need for and sort of scope out um, and then continue to sort of be the bridge between the vendor and the agency, um, uh, so, you know, both um, ensuring that, you know, agency's needs were, you know, well represented continually and also, um, again, sort of looking to, um, you know, reinforce some of the practices around human-centered design and agile software development that, um, you know, 18F and, and other folks at GSA are really working to to diffuse. Um. Excellent. Any more questions out here? Nope. Right Good morning. My name is Ralph Ivarra. I'm president of Diverse America Network. I've been in this market for 38 years, and for the last 30 years, I've been an advocate and activist for small and particularly diverse businesses. Thank you for your question. Uh, let me just uh, congratu congratulate you, Ms. Cook, on your position. As someone who has served under various administrations and volunteer capacities, I happen to be the chair of the Washington District Export Council currently, as well as other activities with the SBA, et cetera. Two observations. I'm glad that you are here, present in Seattle, representing GSA. 
because of the sheer volume of federal contracting that is part of GSA. Here's an observation. Too many small, diverse businesses go through the trouble of getting on the GSA schedules. They never get called. They never get the chance to come in and, pr and present their value proposition. I can assure you, for 30 years, they've gone to all the outreach, all the meet and greets, all the activities. Their GSA building is literally a mile from where I live. So n number one, getting the agencies and the procurement people to use those GSA schedules, particularly for those small, diverse businesses, will help you in reducing costs because smaller businesses are more agile. And for the representatives of Dell and VMware, many small, diverse businesses represent those products as well as other products. So I really encourage you to look at how do you utilize the existing small, diverse businesses that are on the GSA schedules, as well as how do you open it up and make it easier for them to do that as well. And then within the context of getting your GSA folks out into the community and connecting, at this point in time, time we hear a lot from federal government folks that we don't have any budget we're expected to stay stay on task where whether it is using technology and connecting with small diverse businesses using technology to be much more engaged so that ultimately those tax dollars that flow up to Washington DC can flow back in the in the form of contracts. So thank you for being here. This is the first time a senior official, I know it's interim, but a senior official from GSA, which represents so many dollars, particularly for those small, diverse businesses here in technology, which as you know, is constantly changing. So it's a challenge for them to always stay up. So thank you and I hope because of your background that you'll see that there's some other opportunities for you to be effective to actually engage with those small diverse businesses starting with the ones that are on the schedule and then expanding beyond that thank you more of a comment but did you want to respond i mean it was more of a comment. i i look forward i guess to working with all the folks that are out here and getting to know people and i do i do have a great appreciation for what goes on I will not cite you the statute, but I know it. I'm very familiar with it. <laughs> any, any more from the audience? Uh, we've got one. Actually, sir, just if you don't mind, we'll go to we'll come back to you, but give another person a chance here. Good morning. I would recommend next time, because I'm from the South End, we have this meeting at GSA in Auburn, where I can get there in under two hours. Um, question for uh, Corey, uh, with regard to um, acquisition reform, uh, which I think uh, any modernization effort of the government, including the MGT Act and, and um, all the funds that are, that are coming available, I think are very hard to get to. Um, and, and not just for small businesses, but you know, in general. Um, I've been very encouraged by the use of the OTA um, provisions by DOD. And I'm wondering, is there any plan to expand and or reform acquisition uh, policy, acquisition regulations, in order to enable the government to take advantage of private sector innovation? That is a fantastic question. The answer would be yes. Um, if you look at the President's IT Modernization Report, one of the action items is for the FAR Council, GSA, DHS, OMB, to all work together to look at ways to reduce barriers that are currently present because one of the key findings of that report um, that we worked on was that we can, you're absolutely right, you can talk about modernizing, but if you don't look at some of those barriers in the acquisition world to get there, you're missing, you're gonna miss a large piece of that. So that is one of the primary things that we are focused on. There should be some things coming down the pipe I believe a lot of that is due towards the mid to end of the summer for them to look at some of that and to come out with things. But I know on GSA's end, um, we are already starting to look at our GSAR and to promulgate some changes. I believe it was the OLM that was recently changed, if I'm not getting that wrong. But that is exactly one of the key takeaways and 
that is something that um, Administrator Murphy, with her expertise in acquisition, is definitely focused on how to make acquisition. Um, one of her tenants is looking at task orders. <laughs> so really, that is a focus, because what I hope you were getting at is that the in order for us to get the best value, we have to look at our acquisition contracts and schedules and BPAs and everything in order to get the modernization right. Um, GSA has a lot of assistance helping people. We have AAS, we have the 18F acquisition shop. Since we do so many contracts, it's a lot easier for, not easier, it's helpful for our folks to go and help other customer agencies with those legacy modernizations. But there are some barriers broadly just in the regulations, and that is one of the president's tasks for us is to look at that. I am not familiar with the OTA process part. Um, his, I, I know that, but it was that was given to DOD in the NDAA recently, but I believe it was limited to DOD. So this is, this is, yeah, this is actually other transaction authority. I'll just give myself a little plug here. Yeah. I've been digging into these uh, <laughs> and, and midway through a series on, on NextGov. So if you're curious about OTAs, where they come from, what they are, where they stand, uh, I encourage you to, to check out that series because it is a fascinating and, and inscrutable area of, of government contracting. Uh, Melissa, before we, we start to get toward the end here, did you, what kind of acquisition uh, issues did you run into all at 18F? And how did you get around them? What kind of interesting solutions did you see? Mm. Well, um, so the first thing I'll say is that I was not the person on the team who's the acquisition <laughs> expert. Uh, so fortunately, I you know was working on a team of folks, um, others who primarily handled you know the details of, of any contracting issues. Um, so you know, uh, to be honest, I might just want to leave it there. That's fine. <laughs> stick, stick to your expertise. I have no problem with that. We have time for one more question. All right, then. Join me in thanking our, our fantastic panelists uh, for joining us today.